many of you know Sujoy Moga, who was a language student at our department. And after doing uh, his PhD from here, he was a postdoc with uh, uh, Professor Padmanabhan at Ayuka. And then uh, later on, he was also a postdoc with Daniel Sularski at Mexico, Yunnan. You can see that this is what we're thinking of Sularski. And presently, he is a JSPS fellow at uh, this um, accelerator organization in KK Sukuba, Japan. So for the um, last, I think about uh, three years, perhaps uh, around three, two or three years, he has been working on issues related to measurement problem, information paradox, uh, which is a very old problem in quantum uh, mechanics in general and black holes in particular. And so today he will uh, give his views on this particular subject, as he has uh, been working on. So, I would request uh, Dr. Mota to stop. Thank Thank you for the kind introduction, and thank you, sir, for giving me the opportunity to to come back here after completing PhD and give this talk. And it is always nice to come back to your research institute. It's like a home to you, <laughs> and give a talk, and of course uh, take feedback from the people you admire. So, so it's really nice feeling right now. Uh, so, so uh, I'm going to give uh, a talk on this topic, black hole information paradox. And uh, basically, uh, I would, uh, in this talk, I would pose a question whether whether uh, gravitational influence on quantum mechanics, or in, in, in general, or gravi gravitational influence influence on quantum collapse of the wave function, give a hint uh, to resolve this. Um, uh, Paradox. And this paradox is very, very, very old, like 40 years uh, or so. And uh, this this uh, talk is based on the following two papers. These two pa these two papers, and I did it with uh, Leonardo, uh, who was a postdoc, along with me, Igor. Uh, he, he is a faculty in a university in Mexico City. And uh, uh, Daniel Sudaski, uh, uh, with whom I was a postdoc uh, uh, at UNAM uh, from 2013 to 15, uh, just three months ago I came to here. So this this uh, subject uh, I'm pursuing even in my uh, JSPS uh, research. Uh, so uh, anybody ha uh, have any interest? I would suggest to go in these two papers after the talk and send me any question if you have. So before I start my talk, I would like to say something about uh, about an interview uh, earlier this year. Uh, Professor Steven Weinberg, uh, which I think everybody knows, uh, uh, whom everybody uh, actually, uh, anybody working on physics or, or, or having uh, some kind of exposure in field theory uh, should know his name and also because he, he got the Nobel Prize because of his theory uh, standard model in 1979. So he was uh, asked a question uh, about his view on the final theory of everything uh, in this uh, journal, Scientific American, 
and uh, he, he was asked uh, that uh, what is his view about the feasibility of going to a final theory uh, where uh, one can unify basically all fundamental forces of nature. And in his reply, he said that I think our best hope is to find some successor theory to which quantum mechanics, as we now know it, is only a good approximation. So, it, uh, so he doesn't think that quantum mechanics, uh, as we know now, or the textbook version of quantum mechanics, mostly popular version, is a complete description of reality, or uh, there, uh, or, or there, uh, it cannot be improved. So, so he thinks that it is a good approximate theory, but we need to go beyond that to to, uh, to, to get to any 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 sort of final theory. In fact, if you see historically uh, from the, the beginning of quantum mechanics. Uh, there were questions about on the foundation of quantum mechanics, starting from Albert Einstein, Richard Feynman, and then uh, it was continued by Murray Gell-Mann, Anthony Leggett, uh, Roger Penrose, John Bell, George Ellis, and there are many people who always have asked uh, uh, discomfort about uh, the, the the mathematical or interpretational foundation of quantum mechanics. Uh, and in this talk, uh, philosophically, we will see how we agree with this view. Anyway, I'm not going to talk about any final theory of everything that would be too much for me, but in the case of black hole information paradox, we would see that how this view help us to give a resolution. So the, the content of the talk is the following. I would, I would talk about the information paradox. Uh, it's a general overview of the problem. I, I, I take some time to, de to, to describe this. So, because there is a lot of confusion, uh, which is or which is not actually the paradox. And then I give a uh, historical uh, development of the problem, which is really confusing. Uh, and and uh, then I, I would uh, go to my, uh, my, my uh, uh, approach. Uh, actually, we are going in the alternative route, uh, where uh, we will try to destroy the information inside black hole. Uh, and this is contrary to what has been uh, popular so far. Uh, and of course, we'll do that by questioning the foundation of quantum mechanics, and finally, I'll conclude. So please do ask me a question if you have in between. So, so, the, so let me give you a brief uh, introduction, general overview of black hole inform information paradox. So black hole with classical fields, if you don't treat anything quantum mechanically, uh, the, the geometry background geometry or the fields in the background uh, in that background geometry are completely classical. Then, uh, then this is the picture. So black holes are, as we know, the final stage of massive coll collapsing bodies or uh, stars. And because of the Lohmeyer theorem, uh, this final state is characterized by very few parameters. For example, the mass, charge, uh, and angular momentum uh, of the black hole. And it, see, it, it may seem that all the information about the collapsing matter is simply lost. Uh, so does it mean that there is information loss? Uh, note that this is not, the, uh, not uh, the case of loss of information, because this loss of information refers only to the outside observer, outside observer means the observers outside the event horizon. So if one takes into account the, also the interior of the horizon, one can in principle use the data inside and outside the horizon to reconstruct the initial state of the space-time and matter. So therefore, classically there is no puzzling, there is no information loss. And uh, the case, uh, if you now go to the uh, one, one step high, that is you treat the background geometry or the gravity classically, but the fields quantum mechanically, then uh, it is inevitable that quantum treatment of fields in a bl black hole background uh, gives Hawking radiation. So Hawking radiation means that quantum mechanically black hole will lose its energy and it will, it will emit all sorts of particles quantum mechanically. And uh, with respect to a distant observer, the mass of the black hole becomes zero in a finite time. If one keeps aside dramatic possibilities like a Planck size, remnant, etc., the final space time becomes Minkowskian once again after the black hole evaporates, and the entire mass of the black hole is converted into radiation. Now the question is, how does this alter information problem? <coughs> okay, so, so, so consider that uh, we have a quasi slice which is partially inside and outside the event horizon, and 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 quantum fields. Uh, inside and outside the event horizon have support in the corresponding regions. 
So this figure, for example. So so, so this is the a non-evaporating black hole classical case. So uh, you have a, a collapsing. So you have a collapsing matter, and then there is a black hole horizon. But if you don't treat it quantum mechanically, then it is a non-evaporating black hole, and uh, nothing is puzzling. So uh, something is falling here, and the observer here will not have access to this information. So this is not the case of information loss. But this one, so 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 here it is evaporating black hole, and and uh, because of Hawking radiation, there will be uh, there will be uh, emission from. Uh, from the black hole, and they, they, that will reach the asymptotic observer here. Okay, and mostly this is thermal. Now, uh, so, so this is a, these are the quasi slices, space-like slices, on which you define your initial data, and and this data will propagate, uh, will will evolve in the forward light code using your quantum uh, evolution. So, so in 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 the initial state uh, hypersurface, you have a pure state. Uh, and then it will evolve quantum, uh, in, in, in quantum mechanically. And if you see any intermediate uh, quasi slice here, so part of the quasi slice will be inside the horizon, and part of the quasi slice will be outside the horizon. Okay. So it may it may appear that in the outside you don't have all the information, but that is okay because there are correlation between interior the modes having support here and the modes having support here. So, so uh, you have correlations between them, and that correlation can give you back the information. <coughs> so, so the 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 uh, the answer is that here also the state is pure, and you don't have any information loss. Just that information is hidden behind the horizon, and you have to look for the correlation to, to reproduce the initial state or uh, uh, to find all the uh, information back. However, how do you have these correlations between the interior and the exterior? So uh, this is the characteristic of Hawking radiation that interior modes themselves are uncorrelated, and exterior modes are themselves uncorrelated. So we can do, uh, check that by calculating the number uh, of uh, density uh, in particular mode given by frequencies say omega one and omega two, and if you calculate the joint in, in omega one and in omega two, find out the expectation value which would be in omega one expectation value and in omega two expectation value both inside and outside. So there is no correlation as such uh, among the modes interior or, or exterior, but there are correlations because these modes are entangled. If you if you if you fix the uh, number operator here, that will automatically fix the number operator here because these are entangled modes. So we have to look for entanglement. Yes, uh, and uh, yeah, and that give you uh, give the entanglement entropy in black. So if you look into the semi-classical picture, the yeah. way Hawking did the calculation, then you don't have no, no, no. There, there is pair production. Yes. So yeah. the negative energy falls down. Yes. So pair production automatically means there is entanglement. Yes, there is. Yeah, but if you, I, I'm not sure whether you can do a full quantum mechanical treatment for 4D, I mean 3 plus 1 black holes, but at least in 2 plus 1 or 3 plus 1. 1 plus 1 you can. Yeah, 1 yeah. plus 1 you can yes. do. So there does does such correlations arise? That is the question. Yeah, correlation is always there. Correlation uh, is always there in here between this and this one because because you can find out the relationship between the Bogolyubov transformation from the initial state to the there will be two set of Bogolyubov position. One from the from this initial state to the to the to the state here which belongs to the interior Fox space, and another set of Bogolyubov transformation which will relate the state here with the exterior Fox space, and these Bogolyubov transformation are related. So that is the that is the uh, 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 signature that they are entangled. Basically, they are very strongly entangled. So 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 there will be entanglement, and that that actually uh, has the information. I think it's related to the fact that because there is no singularity at the event horizon. So yes, 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 you can yes, actually yes, connect yes, 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 whichever way. Yes, yes, yes. So is there, I mean. Depending on a nice choice of coordinates, yes. you can arrange things so that you can. Yes, arrange. because our horizon is an artifact. Yes, so or there is no singularity. No physical. No, so you can, can have this. Uh, yes. Also, in this region, the space time is globally hyperbolic. So, so if you, if your singularity is on the future, in this region, the space time is globally hyperbolic, and there is no question of because the quasi problem is well defined. If you give the initial state, and then all the information will go forward. Uh, so it is there should not be any loss of information at this stage. Uh, this one? Yeah, what's your time? For the second slice. From here to here? No, no, the one which is penetrating the horizon. 
Yeah. What's your time evolution t? Is what I'm asking. Which one? Which is, which is your? How do you define t? Yeah, how do you? Okay. Okay. So okay. What's your u? Your t? Yeah. So I'll come back. I'll come back to this slicing uh, later on. So I'll define. So you cannot define the time with respect to the external observer because that time doesn't have any meaning here. So we have to define a forward forward driven function, monotonically forward uh, evolving function uh, as your time. So which may, which may not be the physical time here, but uh, a, a, which can be uh, used to parameterize the Cauchy slices. So we will we'll come back. So, so the question is that at this point there is no loss of information. Even if you, if you take the back reaction into account, so this will be the picture when you have back reaction. Now see, uh, if you go to this slice, in this slice, uh, you, you, you still have singularity, classical singularity at this point. Now, uh, it may appear that here you have a mixed state, but uh, the question is can you say that there is loss of information? Uh, the, the answer is that uh, one might say you can still information problem is not well defined because you started with a quasi slice which, which, which was uh, covering all, all the space time and here you have a slice and then the singularity is not included. Because singularity is, is, is not included in this slice. So, so technically, this is not a quasi slice. If this is not quasi, then the information uh, problem is not well defined because information is actually uh, need to be preserved between one quasi slice to another quasi slice. So, still, if you treat back reaction uh, and, and, and don't treat, uh, uh, and, and still you treat singularity classically, that you have a classical singularity, then also you don't have a well defined information paradox because there is uh, the final slice which is not Cauchy. So th that's what the situation, if you take into account quantum field uh, uh, in the classical ge geometry, but treat singularity classically. Okay, so, so when does the information paradox clearly arise in black holes? So uh, as I told you, a careful inspection indicates that the information paradox in black hole evaporation becomes clear only when one considers quantum gravity theory will resolve singularity. A singularity, as we know, is a breakdown of geometrical structure of the space-time. It is considered as a boundary of the space-time. If this remains, one has to agree on the fact that information will be codified in this boundary or leak through and, and this making information loss trivial. But, but this would not seem satisfactory to anyone working on quantum gravity and also to most of the physicists who expect a theory of quantum gravity will replace uh, what we call singularity in classical GR. So, so if, you, if you treat uh, qu singularity qu quantum mechanically and if you be, uh, expect that a quantum gravity theory will basically replace uh, the singularity by some quantum gravity region, then you have this picture. So the picture is that you started with a pure state here uh, and then there was a collapse, for example, it, it can be a null collapse at this point of time and that forms a black hole. And, uh, and, and this was the singularity in classical geometry, classical general relativity, and now it is replaced by quantum gravity. And what quantum gravity does is that it will replace the singularity and give you back the, back the well-defined space-time. And when you t it gives back the space-time, now you see that you have a well-defined quasi slice here. And then the question is well posed. So you have a quasi slice here and you have a quasi slice here. The question is that whether all the information that was given to you here will be, in, uh, will, will be carried, carried through until this quasi slice or not. And that is the uh, question usually people ask and, and, and the answer is unfortunately is very non trivial. And, and, and that, that leads to uh, the paradox. So people don't know whether one can unitarily relate one, uh, quant, uh, the initial state of quantum field to the final state of the quantum field or not, because the space-time is not globally hyperbolic. You see that global hyperbolicity is, uh, until this point of, uh, until, until before singularity it was globally hyperbolic, and after that we don't know, uh, uh, there is no uh, time-like killing vector which can take you from here to here. Anyway. Uh, so uh, as I told you that uh, quant uh, once quantum gravity resolves singularity and offers after the evaporation a standard space time, then it is clear that the so-called interior of the black hole is vanished and there is no energy left for the de required degrees of freedom which could possibly carry the information because th there is nothing. So all the, all the interior of the black hole has left and you don't have any degrees of freedom left and then you, uh, 
and and then one expect that the final state of the quantum field is immediately related with the initial state. However, it is not clear, and uh, and there is no convincing solution showing this happens. And this emerged as the true information paradox in black holes. So so yeah. So this is the uh, twists in the story, uh, many twists, starting from 1976 when Hawking proposed that information is lost in black holes. Uh, so he believed that information is in inevitably lost. Until 1993, Saskin came with the idea of black hole complementarity, and he he he, uh, this, uh, he he argued that information must be preserved because of this complementarity proposal. Uh, this complementarity is basically a correlation between the modes which were emitted very early stage of black hole evaporation to the modes emitted at very late stage of evaporation. So they need a correlate, strong correlation between the uh, these modes to be able to get back the information, and that is the black hole complementarity. And and uh, people were silent. They thought that this is the case. Even 2003, Maldasena said uh, information should not be lost. Uh, because of EDS CFT, because if you see in the CFT side, there is no loss of information, so why should be in EDS uh, gravity, uh, uh, gravity side there should be any information? 2005, Hawking changed, lost his bet, and changed his side that saying uh, that okay, information is not lost, and uh, so it took 30 years to change this side. However, in 2012, the infamous paper came of uh, Firewall, and that paper actually. Till today, nobody has been able to uh, prove them wrong. So what they argued is that it is impossible to get information back by respecting the general relativity equivalence principle and quantum uh, immutability at event horizon. So that is the problem. So if you want to get back all the information, what they argued, you have to give up equivalence principle at the event horizon. Uh, so, so this is the uh, big controversy. A, a, a crisis because if you uh, are, uh, if somebody say give up equivalence principle near the singularity, so one can believe that because at the near singularity you don't expect that general relativity would be uh, very strongly valid. However, at event horizon you don't expect that you, uh, the, the, uh, the equivalence principle should be thrown away. So, so, so this brought a real crisis and there are uh, exponential increase in the number of papers uh, uh, in the in the information paradox uh, in 2014 if you remember Hawking said okay in that case there is no event horizon there is no black hole and information lo is lost due to our inability to restore it uh, like weather prediction <coughs> so in weather prediction you don't know you cannot predict the weather uh, with 100 percent accuracy but in principle you could uh, so this was a two and a half page uh, paper it was like a statement no calculation, nothing, and I don't think anybody takes this seriously. Anyway, so <laughs> so the, the 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 story is that it is a long, confusing, and unsolved problem. So if you want, if you have idea, please go on and explore this. And what we think that a successful resolution may well open a door to new physics. And I'm going to tell you something uh, about that, uh, which we think may be the case, but subjected to future. Uh, verification, experimental verification or something. Anyway. So we are going in an opposite direction. So people have been trying to restore information and fail. And we are saying, OK, wh why, we, we, why don't we go in the opposite way, uh, breaking the one-way traffic? Uh, so we are go asking that what would be a, should be a reasonable solution of the paradox where information is lost. Uh, and from our point of view, <coughs> Uh, a correct resolution of information paradox where information is lost would require to explain how a pure state becomes thermal state corresponding to a proper mixture rather than improper mixture. <coughs> so you start with a pure state and you have to show how it becomes a thermal state corresponding to a proper mixture. Note that proper mixture represents an actual ensemble of systems, each of which has been prepared to be in different but definite states, with their proportion in the ensemble determined by the corresponding weight. So you have a complete system, and each of the uh, 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 sorry, you have a uh, ensemble, and each system in the ensemble have a well-defined weight, and uh, and uh, that weight is thermal. Okay, that is improper, a proper mixture. So it, it, it describes the complete ensemble, complete 
uh, so you don't trace over anything. And whereas in improper mixture, it represents a partial description as provided by the reduced density matrix of a subsystem, which is a part of a larger system, which is as a whole in a pure state. So what does it mean is that if you think about a system and divide it into A and B and trace over the degrees of freedom A, and then you can get a thermal state. What, and that happens in black hole, that happens in blue radiation. But that state, thermal state, usually is called an improper mixture because you have thrown away some degrees of freedom. A proper mixture means the, the, the whole system you have to take, you should not discard any degrees of freedom and see what is the weight of individual system. And that is the proper mixture. And, and, and to, to be able to say anything about, uh, about uh, the information loss, one has to take the whole system, not any subsystem, even in black hole. So that is the, the, that is the question, uh, thing which one has to do to show whether information is lost or not lost. If you can show that there is a way to get a proper mixture of thermal state, that means information is lost. If not, then information is not lost. So, uh, so this is our approach. Uh, we, our approach is that we think that the root of the paradox, which is so old, 40 years, lies at the foundational problem in quantum theory, specifically the macro-objectification problem, the measurement problem, and the preferential basis problem. So these are the problems in quantum uh, foundation. Uh, also, now you know much better than me. Anyway, I will explain this thing. Uh, and these are really old. It's not very new. And uh, we shall show that, uh, uh, explicitly show that a modified schematic version of quantum theory, uh, such as given by the continuous continuous localization theory, CSL theory, which has many names. Sometimes it is called dynamical reduction theory. Sometimes it is called wave function collapse model, uh, uh, reduction model. Uh, so it has many names, but the idea is similar. Uh, so we'll use one of these theory. I'll explain this theory briefly. And we'll also have a novel hypothesis that we put forward uh, uh, and this hypothesis is about how gravitational field may influence the quantum superposition of states. So I'll try to talk about that, and I'll show that this provides an interesting part to this on the problem. Okay, so so I have to talk a little bit about this thing. Who does not know that there are some problem in quantum foundation? So I I, I talk about I have uh, mentioned these three problems. Now let me talk briefly about this problem. So the first problem is the macro objectification problem, and uh, all of us knows that know that according to standard Schrodinger equation, if uh, psi one uh, and psi two, these are the two states, uh, and these are solution of the Schrodinger equation, then uh, c one psi one and c two plus c two psi two is also a solution which is the uh, linear property of quantum mechanics, and this always holds in quantum mechanics. So. Uh, now consider a situation where we are increasing this size of system size. According to Schrodinger equation, this linear property holds when the system size is large, even at macroscopic level. But we do not see macroscopic superposition. So a macroscopic object is simulta not simultaneously here or there. It is either here or there. So, so clearly, we don't see this linear property of quantum mechanics after certain certain uh, level. If you increase the size of the quantum system, then certain level this linear property has to be broken. But we do not know actually uh, when and how this is broken, starting from quantum mechanics. Uh, and quantum mechanics does not say anything about this quantum to classical transition. So you may say that quantum mechanics is not designed to do that. So it is okay. But if I ask uh, for a theory which will tell me that, uh, give, guide me where this linearity is broken, then it is clear that you need something new. You need something additional. So original, uh, the existing tool of quantum mechanics is incredibly successful, but this does not guide us to this problem, this issue. And there is, then there is the measurement problem of quantum mechanics. Many physicists have worked on that in their life. Uh, it's, it's really a world problem and very confusing. Very, very debatable, controversial. Uh, so, to to understand this problem, recall that in Copenhagen interpretation, which is mostly used in textbook of quantum mechanics, time evolution of a system is controlled by the Hamiltonian via the deterministic Schrodinger equation. This equation, right? This is the Hamiltonian, and this process is always unitary. 
So, so let us call it as new process as done by Roger Penrose. So we, uh, in, in, if, you, if you have a quantum system and you leave, leave it, don't measure it, you leave it by itself, so it will evolve by itself. And it will evolve deterministically use, uh, by Schrodinger evolution until you measure. When you measure, uh, for example, upon measurement of the observable O, the system passes to one of the eigenstates uh, corresponding to some eigenvalue, and this is a jump. So there was a complete uh, um, uh, continuous evolution. At certain point, there is a jump from the linear superposition of all states to one of the states. And that is called the induction of the uh, quantum state. And, and uh, what we can only say uh, is that we can give you uh, give a probabilistic, uh, probabilistic measure uh, of getting a particular uh, state, uh, particular eigenstate. And this is given by the bond probability rule. This is the bond probability rule. So starting with the linear superposition, we can say that there is a probability given by this, and this is the probability that the state will jump to the state. So, and, and this is a discontinuous process, is, is, uh, as in quantum mechanics, and it happens only when you measure, and this is called the R process or reduction process. However, you see that this, these are two completely different processes. One is very continuous and deterministic, another is stochastic and discontinuous. And they are, they are actually divided by a notion called measurement. But what is a measurement? I mean, uh, there is no mathematical description in, of measurement in quantum mechanics. It's a notion, it's an it's a assumption, it's a notion, uh, and that is usually used. Uh, if, for example, when exactly uh, the system, uh, when does the theory indicates that the evolution should be according to one, that is the U process, and when according to R process? What is the boundary? Theory does not have an internal rule saying, the, saying about this thing. And this is called the measurement problem, uh, and, and, and this is very old criticism <coughs> of foundation of quantum mechanics. The third one is the preferential basis problem. So for example, you, start, uh, you can write a quantum state into one basis. Here I have used the basis AN, where A <coughs> is a possible realizable state of the nature, with probability again given by the uh, bond probability rule. However, Note that no one has been able to argue uh, when, why AN, not another orthonormalized state, BN is chosen, or if there is a preferred basis we are looking for. So for example, we do experiment in the laboratory, and we choose a basis. Why, why particular that basis? Why not another orthonormalized basis? If you choose another basis, then your experiment will not agree with the, with the theory. In a particular basis, of course, they will agree. So surely there is a preferential basis, uh, but how, how, I choose a, how cho I choose a basis? So usually what we do that uh, in, a, in a experiment, a, a, a experimentalist knows his apparatus, he knows what he is measuring, and by, by his exp uh, experience, he knows which basis to choose automatically. But that is not coming from the theory, that is, that is coming from, the, from, from, the, from outside. Okay? And, and in fact, to choose a basis, an observer, which may be an experimentalist, to choose a basis, an observer is brought in our way to describe the reality in one particular basis. So if you don't put an observer on the top of quantum uh, mechanics, then there is a problem to, 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 to explain a, your experimental outcome. So, so this means that without observer, there is no reality in, in quantum mechanics. So these seem to be very, uh, it may seem that these are very philosophical and, 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 and actually this was, uh, the criticism uh, to the foundation of quantum mechanics long that these are philosophical problems it doesn't have any, any, any relevance in, in our, in, uh, our uh, real life. Uh, however, uh, this is changing now. Uh, there are uh, problems in early universe cosmology in terms of uh, formation of cosmic, uh, seeds of cosmic structure. There are very uh, interesting uh, issues which cannot be resolved by standard quantum mechanics, and people are using other versions. And I will show also about uh, this problem about black hole information paradox. So, uh, so there are some potential uh, influence of this foundational problem in uh, in, in in nature. In fact, uh, Anthony Legat Legat was the Nobel Prize winner 2003. He is using this. Uh, testing the foundational issues in quantum matter system. So there is an ongoing effort to take whatever the foundational people has done 
and take some of them and try to see if they have some relevance in the real uh, world systems. And, and, and that is very interesting. And I'm going to talk about information paradox, and this is uh, one of the examples. Anyway, before, before going to going there, uh, let me... So, so those are the three problems I have uh, already mentioned, three uh, major problems of foundation. And there are many versions, there are many approaches to resolve those problems. For example, manual interpretation. You don't change anything, just, just interpret that there are many words, then you bypass those problems. But it is very counterintuitive to, to, to believe that. Then there are de Broglie Bohmian mechanics, uh, which is very interesting as well. And then this, has, this is the another approach, uh, the CSL theory, which is a dynamical state reduction model. Uh, and and, and uh, it, it has actually quite long history. It started from 1976. And uh, <coughs> the papers, the, found, uh, the original papers in this theory are cited about 2,000 to, 1000 to 2,000 times. So, so this uh, idea exists for some time and is quite popular about, uh, among the people working on uh, quantum foundation. So, for, uh, so, so this, uh, this idea started with Girardi, Nimini, and Weber uh, in ICTP, Trieste. They, they proposed uh, some modification on standard quantum mechanics. Philip Pearl of Hamilton, Hamilton College in US, so he is still working. Uh, and then Diocy Payne rose, and recently, if you see, Weinberg has written a few papers on this uh, theory. So the idea is that improve some some way improve the standard quantum mechanics so that it can no it it it, uh, it can it can explain the experimental outcome, but not only that, it can also explain the problem I mentioned, and it can additionally give you some important insight. So this CSL theory. Uh, is defined by these two equations. So first equation is a stochastically modified Schrodinger equation. So this one is the time evolution of the uh, quantum state from time 0 to t. And you see that there is a uh, Hamil, uh, Ham Schrodinger uh, evolution or Hamiltonian evolution, this term, which is standard in quantum mechanics. And there is this nonlinear term here. And this term is stochastic. Actually, that term uh, uh, mathematically describes your measurement. And, and it will give you a stochastic outcome because the W of t is a random classical function of time of white noise time, and this pro and, and the probability distribution of this uh, uh, this is given by this equation. So, so th this equation means if you start from if you start from some t equal to okay, so this is t, and this is a W of t. So you are, you are looking from t equal to 0 to t equal to t, the evolution of the uh, wave function or quantum state. And then this wt is uh, completely sto uh, stochastic. So it can be you know, very, okay. it is stochastic. And uh, what you can do is that the, uh, divide this uh, continuous interval by small, uh, small steps. Okay, and in and each of which has some width of dt, say, <coughs> and this gives give you a, a a a fluctuation in the value of omega, that is d omega. Okay, but in this time, so for example, this was t one, so this will be d omega at t one. Okay. And this was the value of omega, say, the mean value here, omega of t, t1. And there will be some state which will give you d omega of t1. So in each of the state, state will get a, 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 a mean value of, a, a, a average value of, uh, not omega, w. And there will be a spread. And for the entire process, what you will get a set of values of w of t. So if one, when you evolve from t equal to 0 to t, so you will get a set. If you repeat this step again, you will get another step. So it is not guaranteed that the, this set of w of t will be same if you repeat this, because it is a stochastic function. So, so if you see that, uh, if, you are have a, if you are having the same initial state, you, you, you evolve it you know, in number of times, 
this will be every time it will be different and that will slightly give you a different final state so how did you choose a hat yeah so the a hat is called the the collapse operator so this the, the the meaning of this term is that it will help you to break the superposition and give you one of the eigenstate of this and and the eigenstate will be uh, a eigenstate of this collapse operator a so it will, uh, the, the, the state will collapse to one of the eigenstate of this operator A stochastically and that will be uh, controlled by the stochastic function. Usually in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, A is always assumed to be the smear position operator. So in, irrespective of whatever, whatever you uh, anyway, anyway. Yeah, so because I, I have to go to black hole information parameter. Okay. So there is a characteristic uh, width or, or leg scale yes. uh, along with this one. But, but, yeah, so I'm not using that. So that so, you, you have to fix that value. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there is some likelihood value of that. Yeah. So, so, so the, so this one is here in this equation. So that constant <coughs> does not appear in this equation. Equation. Ah, okay. No, 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 but in the actual calculations you do, that will appear at some point. Yeah, 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 yeah that will appear at some point. But, at, but yeah, that will not appear at this point when you are evolving the state. Hey, anyway, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so, okay. So, in the non-relativistic limit for any experiment you do, the theory uh, says that you have to choose the position operator, and the localization will happen because of this nonlinear term to one of the eigenstate. So, you can have localization here or there, uh, and uh, it also introduces a new fundamental constant of nature. So, uh, so this is not a fundamental theory so far. So, it, has, it is a schematic version. It has to be improved a lot, and but in future, if it is found that it is a a uh, good candidate of a uh, improved theory, then this lambda would be elevated to a under fundamental constant of nature. And uh, this is small enough not to be violate any subatomic prediction of standard quantum mechanics, however, big enough to provide rapid localization of macro objects. Uh, and, and, and until 1986, this is the 1986 value, uh, they put a bound on this lambda, which was 9, 10 to the power minus 16 second inverse, so that there is no contradiction with the known experiment. I think now it is 10 to the power 13 or 40. So I I, I don't know, but uh, but that is not something very important for us. But the thing is that you have to put bound on this by doing new matter wave interferometry experiment and refine this. Uh, in 1986, it was the So so these two are the uh, equations of the CSL. And with this equation, actually, you can derive the bond probability rule. You don't have to assume that. You have to assume certain distribution of the uh, stochastic function, and then from that distribution, you can find out the bond probability rule, uh, which is interesting, and the probability is also conserved uh, here. Okay, and uh, one can de derive also the uh, CSL evolution of the density matrix, uh, and it follows the Lindblad type equation, and, and, and its solution is given by this. Uh, again, this is a standard Hamiltonian, and this is the collapse operator you have. We shall meet this equation later on. Okay, so this was a review of. Okay, so this was the review of uh, the uh, CSL theory. So what I have done so far is that I have uh, discussed what is the information loss paradox. Then I have said what was the foundational problem in quantum mechanics. Then I have uh, showed you some equations and uh, in an approach uh, which. Uh, which is uh, which claims that uh, it, it resolves all the foundational problem in quantum mechanics. What I am going to show now is that it actually helps us to resolve the black hole information paradox as well. So, so this is something uh, we are taking the idea from quantum foundation and applying in black hole case. So, what we need for the calculation is that we, we will use a CGHS black hole model, which is a one plus one dimensional black hole. We choose this for simplicity. Uh, you can go to Schwarzschild black hole with minor modification. If you have a question, I can answer. Uh, and then uh, we have to use a toy version of CSL, which is, should be adapted to the field theory of co in curved space time, because the the the, uh, the CSL theory so far I have to uh, <coughs> presented was non relativistic quantum mechanical mini particle system, but we have to adapt it in field theory in curved space time. We have to do certain modifications, and then this is a very this is the key hypothesis goes into the calculation. That is the gravitational influence collapse. So we, we make an assumption that the CSL collapse parameter, this parameter lambda here, 
this parameter, which was constant for non-relativistic quantum mechanics. We, we put forward this hypothesis that actually in curved space-time, it is a curvature-dependent quantity. So we, we make an assumption that CSL Polas parameter is not fixed, but depends, actually increases with the local curvature. So if you have a flat space-time, then lambda is 10 to the power minus 60. But if you go in the curve, curve space-time, then lambda is uh, proportional. So lambda 0 times, uh, I mean, I'll show you the equation. It has some uh, sensitiveness to the local curvature. And also we will use some simplifying, very simple assumption about quantum gravity. Uh, because without that, information paradox is not defined, as I have discussed before. So these are the four things we need uh, to go. Okay. So so this is the CDHS black hole, and the, the action has the 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 the, the Ricci, this is the Ricci scalar uh, Billeton. This is the constant. One constant goes into the uh, so the all this part here goes to, uh, contributes to the background geometry. And sorry, we will take one field here. So all this part will uh, will give you the background geometry, and this field will be uh, propagating, say, on this background geometry. Why do you need to take that extra field? If because this will give you Hawking radiation. This will give you. A, so this is the field. So this will this will give you black hole, and that is the field you are taking, uh, so which is actually going to give you Hawking radiation information problem and everything. So quantum field in cross space time. So this will give you the cross space time, and this is the field. Uh, on the background of that space-time. And it is a feature of two-dimensional space-time that you can always write it in a conformal gauge, conformally flat space-time, always in this way. Uh, so we, we have to find out what is rho, of course. Uh, and then uh, it is also a feature of two-dimensional space-time that the, if you use the uh, clean gordon equation, uh, then you see that the left-moving and right-moving modes uh, separated from each other. They don't, don't talk to each other. So there is no backscattering or anything. So, so left moving will go in, in this way, uh, right moving will go in this way. There is no interference between them. So that gives us some uh, some <coughs> simplification to do the calculation. Okay. So this is the model. So, uh, so this part uh, one and one prime here. Is, so this is the conformal diagram of of the CGHS black hole. Uh, so anybody does not know about conformal diagram, it is just some coordinate transformation. So that all infinities are brought in the finite distance. So this will be uh, space-like infinity, this is time-like infinity, and these are null infinities. So this is future null infinity, this is past null infinity. Uh, all of. So, so this is for the right mo moving mode. So there will be some mode which will go from, from, uh, okay. <laughs> so right movers mean, okay. So maybe this is the right mover and this is the left mover. Uh, anyway, so 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 some modes will go from here to here, and some will go from here to here, so on. So uh, the important thing is that the, uh, before there is there, uh, before uh, when you have a star or something, you mostly approximately you have a flat space time, and this is the region one and one prime, which is usually called the linear linear dilaton platform region, and this is given by this metric, and this metric is flat. You can make a quadratic transformation to write it in Minkowski frame. So this is a flat space time, and, and this is a kind of, uh, you can say, uh, some kind of time. This is, this is Kuskal coordinate, anyway. So at certain value of this coordinate, there is a gravitational collapse. And after the gravitational collapse, there is the singularity, that means there is a black hole, and there is this horizon. So, so after there is a gravitational collapse, the black hole is formed, and it forms a horizon. And there will be a part of the black hole inside horizon, a part outside, and all the observers are outside. So, so any any physical observer is here. So, any mode going from. So, the question is that what happens to all the all this matter which falls into the black hole? That, because that is that is inside black hole, and the question is that what happens when black hole evaporates? Uh, that was the information problem. We will get back all the information. Anyway, so the, the the metric here is given by this metric. The horizon is located when this goes to zero, and asymptotically it is again flat. Uh, you need asymptotically flat metric so that you can talk about particle creation. Otherwise, it, particles are not well defined. So, in, in asymptotic region, you have another Minkowskian type of flat coordinate, uh, and uh, this is not same as the previous one. Uh, okay, so this is the space time, and of course uh, you can quantize the field in the in region. 
So in region means uh, the asymptotically past region here. So you can have a quasis lies here, very near to this, and you can quantize the field here. And this is the quantization of the field. So uh, this field for us is the scalar field dimension. So you can write it in this way. And then you have the plane wave modes, very simple. And then uh, you can define the vacuum for the left moving mode and the, for the right moving mode by this way. And you know what is the initial state. What is the initial state? Sorry, here. Yeah. Initial state was vacuum for all these modes and the pulse for this mode. Pulse means, means a, a coherent state picked above this classical value and vacuum elsewhere. So pulse times the vacuum is your initial state defined on in, initial quasi surface. So that is your initial state. <coughs> okay? And then also you can uh, quantize the field in the out region. So out region means here, you can have it slice very near here, okay, the, here, be below the singularity, because this is not a quasi slice. So below singularity, you can have a quasi slice. Oh, the only thing is that you have, uh, for the right movers, you have two Fox spaces, uh, in, uh, interior Fox space and uh, exterior Fox space, and, and uh, the direct product of two will give you the entire uh, Fox space. And you have, uh, you have the modes support, having support here and having support here. So, so basically, basically this is this is the uh, field decomposition uh, for any right or left moving modes. Uh, so omega prime means, uh, for example, for the exter external observer, uh, where the energy is defined as omega prime, and interior inside the black hole omega t prime, you can write it mathematically, and then there is a harmonic uh, conjugate of that. And these modes are also plane wave because the the final space time is also Minkowskian kind of space time. Uh, okay, so these are the modes defined in the exterior that is outside the black hole, and these are defined in the inside the black hole. So these are the standard thing you do for uh, for the uh, Hawking calculation. You can show that the uh, these modes, uh, the modes in asymptotically past region are related uh, with the asymptotically future modes. Uh, by Bogoli Hotas formations. So you can you can show them. So so that is standard in Hawking radiation. And and one can criticize that well uh, or you, you are using plane wave modes. That is not orthonormalized, so you know this, this is a problem. So yes it is a problem, but uh, but you can uh, you can go to the discrete basis uh, starting from this orthonormal uh, so that the modes are completely orthonormalized. And this can be easily done by using this transformation. So these are the plane waves, and you do this transformation, and these J and N are now discrete basis. So U, J, N, and U star J prime N prime would be delta J, J prime, delta N, N prime, that delta is conical delta. So you can have, you can discretize the nodes so that you have a complete orthonormalized basis, uh, and uh, which is very uh, required for, for, for the definition of particle. Because when you say particle, you have to say in which quantum state, and this is the way you define the quantum state. Anyway, so the non-trivial Bogolikov transformation are only for the right moving sector. Right moving sector means from here to here, because these modes process this collapsed scene matter. When they collapse, start from here to here, they see the change in geometry, and that's why the Bogolikov transformation is coming to the <coughs> These left moving modes never, so, they, they, they don't have, they have trivial Bogolikov -Bogol transformation. Because for them, the space time is always this or always this. So the right, uh, for the right movers, of course, the Bogolikov -Bogol transformations are non trivial. Okay, so what is our task? We are going to ap uh, approach the problem directly. So what we are going to do is that we take the initial state of the quantum field, which was vacuum for the right mover and pulse for the left mover, and we are going to evolve it using CSL evolution. So this is the only change. We have this, we have this state. We are not using Schrodinger evolution. We are using CSL evolution. Okay. We, now recall uh, the, that was the relation uh, evolution of CSL theory, along with the Hamiltonian. There is this nonlinear term, stochastic term here. And uh, note that we shall be working in the interaction picture with the CSL process as an interaction term, uh, so that the state will evolve under this interaction term, which is this nonlinear term. And this is equivalent of setting this free Hamiltonian to be zero. So only dynamical evolution of the state would be because of this. 
Okay, and now we are going to uh, use what I have uh, uh, advertised that we are going to use uh, gravitational influence polar phase. What does it mean? It means that we make a new hypothesis that in presence of uh, gravity, the rate of collapse lambda will be dependent on the DC scalar. So lambda was lambda zero, but now we are putting lambda equal to lambda zero, lambda zero plus one plus this thing. This is kind of empirical formula. You should not take this is a fundamental theory. This kind is kind of effective theory which should come from some other fundamental theory uh, when you uh, trace out the quantum degrees of freedom of gravity. So below quantum gravity, we, we, we hypothesize that this is the theory uh, where uh, the Ricci scalar actually uh, increases the strength of the collapse of the function. <coughs> and mu is an appropriate scale, and gamma is greater than equal to 1, so that you don't violate uh, the standard space-time results. Okay, so we need this, and we'll use h equal to 0. What, we else, what else we need is to specify this operator A. Before, this operator was the position operator in many particle system, but now we have field theory in cross space time. <coughs> there are infinitely many degrees of freedom. We cannot use that. So what we propose, we yeah, choose a We have five minutes. Okay, so we choose the operator, uh, which is uh, the number operator. So this is the operator we choose. Uh, which is uh, the number operator defined in the interior basis of the black hole and I for the right movers and, 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 uh, and identity for left movers in the interior and identity for, uh, for right mover and left mover in external uh, basis. What does it mean is that uh, after CSL evolution, the quantum state will be collapsed into one of the uh, eigenstate of this operator. And that will mean that it will collapse with a definite number of particles. So you start with a vacuum state in the in state in, uh, in the infinite past, and that will be collapsed into a definite number of particles when you go uh, near singularity, of course, below singularity. Okay. So this was the quantum state, initial quantum state. One can write it in the external basis just for the sake of calculation. In the external basis, this is summation over all standard particle states. Uh, these are, uh, are uh, yeah. So these are the particle exc excitations in the uh, interior and ex exterior basis, and they are entangled with each other. That's why it is FF. Otherwise, it could be F and other G. Because they are entangled, so that the particle excitation here is equal to the particle ex excitation here. That's why I use F and F. And pulse is pulse, because there is less moving. We are not going to do anything with that. And EF is the total energy of this uh, one of these. Uh, each of the uh, each of the uh, uh, term in the summation have some definite value of E. Okay, so this is the initial state, and we are going to evolve it. So what else we need to evolve? So we need to fully the space time, because once we give uh, once uh, we are given the initial quantum state, we need to evolve it using Cauchy slice, and we have to construct the Cauchy slice. For Minkowski space time, it is very simple. T equal to constant is the Cauchy slice, but for black hole, it is very dif different because the uh, the time defined exterior is not defined inside. So we have to do something to make uh, a act actually a, a, a working definition of time so that the Cauchy slices are well defined and we can evolve using that time. So what we do is this one: Cauchy slices are, uh, are, are are defined by the following manner. In the interior of the horizon, we, we take r equal to first cell r equal to constant. And in the exterior region, we take slash cell t equal to constant, and we join them via Kruskal t equal to constant. So this is a mathematical plot. And, uh, and the prescription is well defined once we provide the joining conditions. That is, this r equal to constant has to join at some point, and only one point, uh, with the t equal to constant curve, capital T equal to constant. And then this capital T equal to constant should intersect with strong t equal to constant only at one point. And uh, this should be unique, and that could be done by specifying the a curve. So these are the curves. This is the curve here inside the black hole T1x, and T2x can be found by reflection of the T1x about the event horizon. So you can find another curve T2x, which is this one, and this curve actually is uh, is uh, carries all the intersection points between R equal to constant with capital T and capital T with small t. And the next thing you want to show that uh, uh, these Cauchy slices don't cross each other. If they cross, then there is a problem because then these are not Cauchy simply. So we can. This prescription is a standard. Prescription. No, 
This is new. Which is new. I mean, this defining the time in this way. Uh, no, the uh, so the time with the crucial coordinate you can do it. We actually you have just reversed the rows of R and T. That is normally inside the event horizon. Outside the event horizon. Yeah, but the joining is. R and T are reversed. Yes. And then you can define the crucial time, which will actually map. I mean, both the same. Yeah, but but the, the how? This is what is. The is standard standard. Not. That yeah, that was. Yes. Okay. So, are we are equal to constant, capital T equal to constant, and they are somehow related with capital T equal to constant is, is standard. Yes. But what is, what is non-standard yes. is giving this intersection curve and show that it is actually well-defined Cauchy slicing by proving that these curves actually don't intersect. And that, that is very very much sensitive to this curve. This choice so this of... This choice that you have done. Yes. So if you... You can... Okay. So if you, if you don't take this curve, you can take another curve. Take another so curve. what will happen that <coughs> Schwarzschild T, which is higher value here, can have a lower below of this curve. You know, I mean, there can be crossing inside. There would not be crossing outside. It is guaranteed because T equal to constant is outside. But there should be would be crossing inside if you don't take this so curve. This, this new point is the Cauchy slicing yes. through this particular yes. choice. Yes, you can have another choice. It is not a. It is it's not, not a unique choice. No. You can have another choice yes. which will also satisfy this property that there is no crossing. Yes. So that it is a forward driven, monotonically forward driven. This choice leads to what you want. Yes. To the, to the yes. Because now what I will do is that given the initial state here, I will evolve here using a global definition time tau. And tau is the intersection of r equal to constant slice with this slice. So tau, uh, now I parameterize all the Cauchy slices with two, two coordinates. One is tau and another is set zeta. I have not shown it here. So tau is the this value, any slice r equal to constant uh, intersects with crucial uh, key equal to constant, that is tau, and another coordinate which, is, which will measure the distance between the uh, distance from this axis. So given a point here, that will measure the distance from this uh, point along with this curve, then along with this curve, and then along with this curve. So if you can give, give this two, then your coordinate are well defined. So it is two-dimensional system. So the two, two coordinates are one in this this way, and another is the distance from this point. So that's how we define the Cauchy slicing, and you can prove using mean value mean value theorem that these slices don't cross, uh, cross each other. So we have shown this in the appendix. Okay. So now I I will not show how it is going to do. Uh, so we had the initial state, and I have given you the CSL evolution. I have given you what is the choice of collapse operator. I have given you the Cauchy slicing. Now it is simple to do the calculation. And what you will find that the final final quantum state near the singularity, but below the quantum gravity region, where the space-time structure is well defined, is this one. This is the final uh, state defined at this Cauchy slice. What is the difference between the initial state? If you see, the initial state was a summation over all the particle excitation. And what this CSL evolution has done, which is, it usually does, it breaks the superposition, give you one of the eigenstates. That's what exactly you can do. Okay, and 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 that is uh, that you achieve near here, and that you achieve only because R diverges near singularity, and that makes lambda diverging. So if you see here, sorry. If you see here, there is this lambda here. Lambda was function of r in this way. If r diverges, then lambda diverges. And what it makes is that you don't have to wait infinite time for the for your collapse. In standard uh, Minkowski space time, you have to you, you uh, wait infinite time for a complete collapse. But but we cannot do that because there is a singularity, and we cannot go beyond singularity. Uh, we cannot wait infinite time. So what this does is that it makes this time infinite, so that even in finite time, the time I define, in the finite time, because of this time diverges, the linearity will be broken. So the linearity here will be broken, and you will get one of the state when tau equal to, when this equal to zero. So my time is tau, okay? And tau, uh, the value of tau at singularity is a over lambda or something. Okay? And that is not infinite. 
but still you are getting uh, the the breaking of superposition because lambda is even this. No, even in the standard case, it is not infinity. It is set by the inverse of lambda t to the power of seventy. Six. Yeah, so you so, are just reducing. You yeah, 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 yeah. So, so lambda you, and you are reducing. So infinity, I mean, t to the power six to seventeen yeah. is. So you are just mm -hmm. reducing it to some tractable. Time. Yes, yes. See. But t to the power seventeen is more than the edge of the universe. No, no, true. That is yeah. why it is set like. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is by hand set like that. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So, so you have to wait more than the age of the universe to, to, to do that. Anyway, so this actually gives you a very uh, strong collapse uh, in finite time because of the uh, enhancement of lambda, uh, because this is scalar diverges uh, in the, this way. Uh, so note that uh, this is a pure state. Uh, there is no summation. The state is pure, but it is undetermined. Why? Because when I go from here to here, I don't know what was the realization of W. And the final state will depend what what is this uh, set you get in one evolution. If you if you evolve second time, there will be second set of Ws, and that will give you a different state. So there is a indeterminism uh, 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 indeterminism in the sense that I don't know what will be the exact uh, exact state. I I can only say what will be the probability of getting one state given by the probability of this Ws. So I, this is pure state, but still undetermined. So what is necessary in this case that go to an example level. So you prepare the system if it a copy infinite copy of the system and evolve each of them and see at the example level what happens. So uh, so we do that from some uh, evolve the example from some initial hypersurface tau zero to some tau uh, finite and then uh, final state of the evolution will depend particular stochastic functions of W alpha uh, uh, that occur during the evolution. So for each system, if you evolve differently, there will be different choices, uh, set of Ws. And, and, and we know what is the initial density matrix because we know what was the initial state. So that is the initial density matrix. And now I use, use the CSL evolution of the, uh, of the, of the, uh, of the density matrix. It's very straightforward calculation. Uh, so lambda was uh, now parameterized with respect to tau because r I have parameter with respect to tau. And uh, this is the equation of the uh, density matrix evolution, so F, F and G, G, so this is, this is clearly uh, of diagonal, uh, so very general uh, density matrix having correlations and all that. So what happens is that when lambda diverges, the only solution, <coughs> only non-vanishing term will be Fng equal to Gng. So if you have Fng not equal to Gng, so that will not contribute. Only, only uh, uh, term that will be non-zero that here will be Fng equal to Gng because lambda goes to infinity. What does it mean? That it will diagonalize this uh, density <coughs> matrix and it will give you this. Okay, you see that now Ff is, Fg is now Ff because of this, this, this behavior. Okay. So, so you have this density matrix here. Of course you have pulse, we are not doing anything with the pulse because it's not something we, we see. So this is the part uh, which, is, which uh, has been affected by the CSL evolution. Now, so, so that was the density matrix defined in this Cauchy slice. So we have defined, we have used the CSL evolution until here to here, near quantum gravity region, where space-time structure is well defined. I have uh, uh, a faith on quantum field in the space-time. But quanta, uh, the, the information paradox is defined from here to here, actually, okay, when the black hole disappears. So, so, so you have to use certain assumption about quantum gravity. What, what quantum gravity will do? Fortunately, for us, the only thing we need is that uh, the quantum gravity will resolve the singularity and lead on the other side a reasonable space-time. So, so here I have addition of space-time, which is standard space-time, and moreover, it will not violate the space-time conservation law. So, this is what we need: uh, that quantum gravity, whatever it is. It cures the singularity and it does not violate the basic space time conservation law. If this happens, then this, uh, this was the state defined here. Okay? And these two parts, this is defined outside the here, say, outside the horizon of, for, to, to the external observer. And these two are, diff are inside. And these two state, uh, this was the negative energy state, uh, which is complementary to positive Hawking radiation. So this state gives you Hawking radiation here, and there is a complementary negative energy flux. This goes into the black hole, and that actually cancels out the pulse, because pulse was the main source of the energy in the black hole. So this negative energy kills 
actually reduces the energy of the black hole and eventually if uh, it has to be equal actually when the black hole evaporates so what what uh, if the quantum gravity does not violate the energy momentum conservation then whatever you find here whatever state you find cannot have a, a lot of energy ideally it has zero energy or it can have some epsilon energy but you cannot have a lot of energy because all the energy has been uh, emitted so what we will uh, you will find at this slice is a, a, a vacuum here in this region and a particle state here in this region and the complete state in this Cauchy slice is the direct product of these two and also you can calculate the final, uh, final, uh, final density matrix defined here and that density matrix would be a identity here in this region that means there is no degrees of freedom at this part here and it's completely thermal here so thermal means there is no correlation you don't have any information and and and, and this one identity and and vacuum means there is no degrees of freedom so what happens there is no information left so there was there is no correlation between these and these modes why because there is no degrees of freedom here whatever information was fallen here because of the matter collapse, uh, collapse was destroyed by the CSL evolution because of the gravitational uh, influence on quantum superposition. Okay, and, and you get this is the final density. And, and remember, note that this is a proper mixture. I have not traced out any degrees of freedom, and that is defined on the entire Cauchy surface. So I have shown how with a uh, pure state and uh, with a uh, pure state you go to a thermal state in the ensemble level corresponding to a proper mixture. That means the loss of information. So the final outlook is that at the ensemble level, we begin with a pure state at the asymptotic pass and ended up with a thermal state corresponding to a proper mixture. Each individual state is pure and has desired proportion at future null infinity followed by an empty region. That is very important because then you don't have any correlation to look for. There is no tracing over any subsystem. Of course, we assume that quantum gravity would resolve the singularity and otherwise be reasonable that it leads to no gross violation of conservation law with potentially observable implication in the regions where something close to classical space-time description is expected. Conclusion is that the loss of information of lateral evaporation is non-paradoxical under the hypothesis that strong gravitational field collapses the state of quantum field in a stochastic manner. Due to this stochastic nature, given an initial state, the final state just before the singularity becomes unpredictable and if one wants to time reverse the process, it is impossible to reconstruct the initial state, hence information is lost. And then, uh, this is uh, very also interesting that the overall mathematical framework is based on dynamical state reduction theory, or the CSL theory, which was proposed to overcome seri some serious problem in the foundation of quantum mechanics. Uh, and we use this theory and put an hypothesis that the fundamental CSL, uh, fundamental parameter of the CSL theory is a local function of space-time curvature. So that we have used. And we, so, so you see that the idea is central. You can use some other theory. Okay? If you have some other way to, to use this idea that gravity, gravity collapses the quantum field, you can use some other theory. But if gravity collapses, uh, the quantum state in a stochastic manner, there is an inevitable loss of information. Now, how do you show that? We showed it using CSL theory. One can use some other theory and other way to do that. And we reiterate that at this point, this is only a toy model, but we believe that reasonable models with basic features we have discussed here do offer strong hope to resolving the long-standing conundrum uh, known as black hole information paradigm. If you ask me why I say it's a toy model, then I can say why. So, what do you have to ask? Okay, thank you. Questions? Yeah, I have a quick question. Actually, see, in all these CSL models, yeah. there is inherent energy loss, energy violation, energy <coughs> conservation violation. In fact, the whole process of stochastic involves some heating, something, something. So, okay, so in any way, that is the only way these theories could be ever verified in the laboratory. That is all, all the effort. I don't know the recent literature. So the recent but literature I'm is that uh, if they can be made compatible with energy momentum conservation. No, no. Made compatible is not a question. Okay. I mean, there is violation, so one has to look yes, for that Yes, yes. So I, if CSL is right, if you leave yes. an isolated system, yes. temperature will keep rising. That is the point. Okay. So 
So now the question is regarding yeah. your talk that yes. now you are considering CSL inside the horizon of a black hole. Now if your energy increases or temperature increases, all that thing will gravitate. Okay. Since in that case I am afraid because you are using a strong parameter. That parameter lambda is said to be so small in standard CSL only because to be keep a, a, yes. a big keep a check on yes. the energy increase, energy yes. violation. Now yes. if you are increasing it to such high values, I am really afraid that all that energy will gravitate and your black hole will never evaporate. Sure. Okay. Its size will continuously sure. increase. So have you done a self consistency check consistency check on this calculation? So, so, so that it the black so, hole at all level. So this is why I call it a toy model. So the reason is that yeah, I have used non relativistic CSL theory yeah, and yeah. it is the feature of non relativistic theory. What I am doing now using a relativistic version. With four dimensional. So we have made some progress. So that the question is that this loss uh, uh, this violation of energy conservation is very important <coughs> and you cannot leave it here and say that we have resolved it. You have to do something else. What we are doing is that in 2012 uh, from uh, Daniel Bedingham from Oxford University has, uh, has uh, 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 developed a model, uh, dynamic state reduction model, uh, which is uh, relativistic. And in that model there is no issue of energy violation or anything. And we are using that model to do this evolution. So we are not now using the relativistic evolution using tomonaga swinger uh, mechanism and that will be the uh, uh, that will be the uh, answer to your question if we can do that we have made some progress we are using uh, for example in four dimension we are using uh, whale curvature because uh, Ricci curvature uh, uh, is is, is uh, um, zero right uh, in the social type black hole and and also uh, so we need to use something covariant so which is W square, W A B C D, W A B C D, <coughs> covariant, and that gives helps us to make the theory covariant. And then we are using Tomonaga Swinger uh, evolution of the quantum state, uh, which is defined on, uh, which is very covariant, right? And now we are trying to show, and we are using Bell Robinson tensor. No, no, that is fine. Yeah. So my question is that you may do something very great there. So I'm no, 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 just let me finish. My question is, what is the lab signature of that kind of a theory? Oh, you are saying about CSL. No, no, relativistic version you are talking about. Has it been a, what is the limit in the non-relativistic physics? Secondly, are there any planned experiments to actually show that this is a verifiable alternative? Because yes. after all you are thinking of alternative to yes, what? Yes, 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 of course. Is it so? Yes. So, so there are two questions. One is, uh, what is the experimental proposal to verify CSL kind of theory? Not this CSL, the one which you are talking about. So this CSL I know it is not be verified, and then it is energy violation. But you are saying that there is a relativistic version in which there is no energy violation. No, no, no. The people people are still trying to uh, verify in, in the non-relativistic many particle system. It is it is so in non-relativistic uh, theory you always have so you can have energy violation, right? In non-relativistic, we have to build a relativistic theory, and that will guarantee that there is no no non-relativistic no energy violation. If you can construct, then it is self-consistent, right? You don't have to check for anything. So, making this is itself showing that there is no energy violation. I don't know what else one needs to show. And then, uh, what is the uh, signature that this kind of theory can be tested? Yes, people are trying to do matter wave interferometry experiment. I have not seen uh, shown this because it is too much to talk about. But they have given some likelihood values of the size of the wave packet the 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 mass of the wave packet and then the time scale uh, it should not decohere by environmental deployments so so if they can make it and make the uh, matter wave interferometry experiment they say that you will see a spontaneous localization because of csl theory you will not see any interference so this uh, the the mass scale is about 10 to the power 6 mm and the length scale is about 100 nanometer and the time scale is about 10 to the power minus 2 seconds and people are, uh, so in the group, Vienna group, if you, you must know that they have done experiment with C60 atom, so C12 uh, atom with 60, so it's a composite object, they did the experiment, this is like 780 mm, and they found the uh, interference, okay, but, but that is not a uh, test of this theory, the test is about 10 to the power 6 mm, and, people, and they are trying to do with bacteria. So why they are trying to do with bacteria? Because they are saying that bacteria is naturally, they can use it as quantum system with, with large size of 100 nanometer size. 
So the only thing they want to do, uh, need to do, is that make sure that they don't decohere because of environmental decoherence. So, so keep them until 10 to the power minus 2 seconds. And that is really, really challenging. So they decohere, they make and they decohere. So uh, this is, uh, they are trying, and people uh, say that maybe in, in, in the next two decades, the mass scale. So it is not like LSC or plant scale. So it's like two order of magnitude, and they hope that. Okay, so let's thank the speaker for an informative talk.